So hello and welcome to this MPTL course titled Trauma and Literature. We just finished uh, Kurt Vonnegut's novel Slaughterhouse-Five and from this session onwards we'll look at the final work of fiction study in this course which is Toni Morrison's novel Beloved and this should be on the screen. So uh, like Sitsi Dagaranga's novel uh, Nervous Conditions, we also look at a, uh, an essay which is a very good coverage on the novel. It is a very good critical examination of the novel, especially uh, from the lenses of trauma studies, which is what we will look at in great details. Now, uh, the name of the essay is Reading Red, uh, The Troping of Trauma in Toni Morrison's Beloved and is by uh, Florian Bass, who was published by, um, the, in a journal uh, Kalali in uh, fall uh, issue 2011. Now, it's published at John Hopkins University Press. Now, it talks about the um, interesting use of colors by Toni Morrison and how the, uh, the color red uh, becomes representative of a certain kind of nervous condition, a certain kind of traumatic condition. Uh, of course, Morrison's Beloved is a novel about spectrality, about slavery, about dehumanization, about, uh, you know, in a rememory, it has different kinds of memory experiences, uh, you know, which play between materiality and spectrality, as I mentioned. And in the process, it just becomes a very complex and dark depiction of a traumatic novel. Uh, it's one of the classic cases of representations of trauma in fiction. You know, it just gets cited almost everywhere. Whenever there's a reference to or a conference in trauma fiction, Morrison's Beloved becomes almost like a, you know, something like a, you know, poster for that kind of scholarship. Now, the reason why I've chosen this essay uh, by Florian Bass is because it really corresponds very well and it's quite compatible to the kind of work that we are trying to achieve in this course, which is looking at the uh, medium of fiction uh, as a very unique uh, focal point through which trauma can be represented, trauma can be calibrated, trauma can be uh, you know, remembered uh, and you know, characterized. Now, I just start off uh, looking at the essay in some details and we'll move on to some of the conceptual concerns that the essay deals with. So, a staggering amount of research has been conducted by Toni Morrison's 1987 novel, Beloved. More than a decade ago, Elizabeth and uh, Billy claimed that a virtual industry of Beloved and by extension on Morrison Onion industry scholarship has evolved. While the text's thematic and formal range has elicited uh, an exceptionally heterogeneous body of scholarship, most researchers within their respective theoretical approaches have focused or at least uh, touched on the text's portrayal of physical and emotional trauma and the character's struggles to survive it. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in trauma studies, Beloved becomes a very, very uh, well-read text, a very heavily anthologized text. Uh, a very heavily, um, you know, critiqued text and critique uh, positively, of course, at uh, a level of academic scholarship. So, Linda Coolish, uh, for example, comments on the continuous struggle for psychic wholeness in Beloved, which requires access to painful memories. And this is a very important bit in the novel where uh, the characters appear uh, fragmented, the characters appear, uh, you know, isolated and alienated. So, the struggle to achieve wholeness uh, to reconnect to a holistic understanding of reality, a holistic form of embodiment is something which you find in Beloved over and over again. Christian Baudu uh, uh, contends that the novel's very opening lines announce the prominent place of pain in the lives of these ex-slaves. So it's a very historical novel as well. It talks about the American slavery and how uh, the identity politics around that, you know, the brutal uh, human history of slavery, imprisonment, torture, abuse, uh, how identities were produced, suppressed, repressed, and, you know, uh, got regenerated through different forms, different uh, figures, spectral, material, all kinds of figures. So there is uh, quite literally uh, the, the ghost of slavery, slavery as a spectral condition, uh, the, the, the spectrogenic quality of uh, slavery, uh, the ontological quality of slavery, and that's something which we see. Um, Anna Coynan reads, the character beloved as a return of the repressed, the ghost of slavery. So there's a very uh, strong classic Freudian reading, uh, the return of the repressed, the, the recursive quality of trauma, uh, the, the classic Freudian model of trauma as a repetitive condition, as a, as a repeating condition, uh, which is there and, and very much uh, in, in beloved. And Claudine Reynard specifically uh, analyzes Morrison's approach to memory and likens it to a work of mourning. Uh, Roger Luckhurst uh, finally affirms Beloved's status as a formative text 
in literary trauma studies. So these are all very, very big names. So and later we find uh, the reference to Cathy Carruth and Whitehead. And interestingly, we were looking at Cathy Carruth's unclaimed experience and Anne Whitehead's uh, uh, trauma fiction in the latter part, in the, in the final bit of this course, uh, right after this uh, reading of Donnie Morrison's novel, we will look at Carruth and, uh, and Whitehead. So it's interesting how this essay on Morrison's novel refers to that kind of scholarship on trauma studies. And that's the reason why I chose this in the first place. It connects the work of fiction and reading of the work of fiction to some of the more philosophical works done on trauma. But as you can see in the very opening paragraph of this um, essay, there's a list of scholarship, uh, a rich range of research which talks about this particular novel and how this becomes a, a novel about spectrality, about mourning, about the history of slavery, about the identities which are born out of this repressed condition and how it also becomes a classic Freudian condition of the return of the repress, how the, you know, the reputation of trauma becomes uh, part of the uh, plot progression in the novel. Now, uh, and this is where it, it comes, this essay comes in as a unique reading, how the color red uh, becomes an interesting marker for trauma, a very interesting signifier uh, of the traumatized identity in a certain sense. So an aspect which has largely been overlooked, particularly in this context, is the text's use of color to portray uh, the consequences of slavery. Certainly, some scholars have remarked on the importance of the color in Beloved. Uh, Cheryl Hall, for example, identifies its use as part of a, uh, a sophisticated system of repeated motives which is at work in Beloved. Here it does not uh, you know, elaborate on this particular aspect of the system. Indeed, Morrison herself has claimed that there is practically no color whatsoever in its pages, and when there is, it is so stark and remarked upon it is virtually raw. However, no attempt at establishing a coherent analysis of the use of even one color has of yet been made. And this is the literature gap uh, you know, this particular essay is trying to address. And it's a very good example of how to write an essay as well. Uh, those of you who are willing to publish on trauma studies and trauma and literature, this can be a very good template for all of you in terms of how you first talk about the scholarship done on a particular uh, domain, whether it's a, it's a literature text, whether it's a film, you know, piece of cinema, painting, whatever the case may be. You first talk about a scholarship available on that domain, on that uh, field, and then you talk about the absence of a certain kind of scholarship. Where is the gap? What has not been done? What has not been explored? And that's where uh, you know, your work can come in as a very interesting intervention, a very original uh, offering in terms of uh, how it can intervene into trauma studies. So, uh, Beloved repeatedly evokes comprehensive palettes of color. It's multicolored ribbons, clothes, and flowers that set a bias during the last weeks in which Beloved is in the house, a quilt with the two orange patches as well as a quilt of merry colors in which Paul D. finds Sethe in the novel's last scene. And the many colors, many different colors that a baby sucks ponders in the last years before a death can serve as examples. Now, what this essay is trying to do quite clearly is how to sort of situate certain forms of psychological condition, certain forms of mental condition, certain forms of embodiment condition corresponding to certain colors. So colors over here become uh, symbols of certain kinds of experiences, or certain orders of experientiality, shall we say. Right? In that kind of a, a chromatic order, uh, we have different forms of embodiment, different forms of traumatic embodiment. So trauma and color begin to become equated. And that's a very original reading, as I'm sure you'll agree. So among this elaborate use of colors, it's the color red which is employed most uh, conspicuously. And it is this color which is intricately connected to the novel's portrayal of trauma, right? So and it's a novel about trauma, about traumatic reputation, about the uh, traumatic body, the traumatic mind, the traumatic subject. But uh, the color red becomes most compatible to this traumatophilic uh, condition, this uh, traumatized condition rather. It appears in some of the central tropes of the novel, such as Paul, D, Paul D's red hurt, uh, uh, Stam Pate's red ribbon, and Beloved's pink tombstone. Additionally, uh, the novel contains a multitude of bloody images due to frequent scenes of bodily harm. So there is this very corporeal quality about trauma. It's about bodily abuse, it's about the violence done to the body, to the black body in particular. Uh, so that, that corporeal quality of trauma, the corporeal quality of damage and violence also gets manifested in the color red. Uh, so it's a very uh, 
bloody novel in a very literal sense. So there's a red heart, and there's a red ribbon, there's a pink tombstone, and there are some images of bodily damage, bodily abuse, which also are uh, depicted with the color red, uh, symbolically speaking. So generally, uh, red serves as an amplifier. Within Western culture, red is almost commonly, most commonly associated with danger, blood, fire, a romantic love, and thus it always marks some notion of intensity. However, in Morrison's novel, its use is more specific. Red is more than just a universal amplifier, even given the highly diverse connotations associated with its respective uh, occurrences, red is traceable uh, to a single source, the, so the evils of slavery. Uh, more precisely, the text negotiates uh, issues of trauma using the color red. This study's central argument is that red is a complex and potent trope in Toni Morrison's Beloved. It constitutes a text in and of itself, and um, it is through the character's interaction with the color that a novel narrates their processing of trauma. Now, this is a very, very uh, wonderful framework, as you can see. Now, what this uh, essay is trying to do at a very symbolic uh, level is look at the way in which the processing of trauma takes place through the color red. How red becomes an amplifier of trauma, how red becomes a marker of trauma, how red becomes a signifier of trauma, uh, and also a symbol of trauma in a certain sense. Right, so there are different kinds of um, connotations and denotations which are depicted by the color red, uh, evils of slavery being a classic case in point. Um, so, um, so in, in a way, red becomes a symbol of interactivity, red becomes a symbol of spectrality, red becomes a symbol of violence, red becomes a symbol of loss, uh, red becomes a symbol of imprisonment. So all these different markers of trauma. Uh, are negotiated with the color red. So the color red becomes the way in which the processing of trauma takes place in a novel. And it's exactly the processing that uh, this uh, particular essay is trying to calibrate, is trying to engage with uh, at a level of scholarship. Now, from this point, uh, what the essay will do, it will talk about some of the critical frameworks uh, uh, in trauma studies. And it will bring in uh, Kathy Kuru, it will bring in Anne Whitehead, and these are two figures, as I mentioned, that we will look at as well in the concluding part of this course. We, we are beginning to wind up. So the last part of the course, right after we finish with Beloved, we will look at Kathy Kiru's unclear experience. We will look at um, Anne Whitehead's um, you know, trauma fiction. And we'll see, interestingly, how this essay, while talking about the color red, while talking about the processing of trauma in Tony Morrison's Beloved, alludes uh, to exactly those works that we will uh, wind up with. So. Trauma theory and beloved. So just a little bit of uh, space uh, and time in engaging with trauma theory, some of the big names in the field. Kathy Carood, one of the biggest names. Kathy Carood, in her seminal study, Unclaimed Experience, has defined trauma as an event which is not experienced but simply registered as it overwhelms the person to whom it happens. So the very ontology of trauma, I and mean, if you remember we did uh, the Ontology of the Accident by Catherine Malibu, again, a very, very critical theory uh, reading of trauma. Now, Carruth, too, has a similar kind of a philosophical framework. Of course, she's writing before uh, Malibu. And she defines trauma as not an event which is experienced, but simply registered, you know, because we, we can't experience trauma fully. And that's the whole ontology of the accident, the whole ontology of the trauma moment, that is impossible to experience it fully, because experiencing and understanding go hand in hand. So trauma is something which is always left ununderstood uh, to a certain extent. We just register it, uh, sometimes passively perhaps. Among the typical reactions to this phenomenon is a reputation uh, compulsion, an urge to continually return to the traumatic event which is not freely accessible to memory, uh, paradoxically aimed at achieving a level of preparedness and facing it in reputation, termed belatedness, right? So, you know, these are the uh, technical terms, belatedness, reputation, etc. And uh, it's almost like a compulsive condition, the, the urge to keep visiting the traumatic moment. And we find this, uh, you know, it's happening throughout the different works of fiction that we have read already. So, and we just finished Slaughterhouse-Five, we find that in the beginning of the novel, when Kurt Vonnegut is trying to write the novel about, you know, the Dresden bombing, he's trying to revisit that moment. He's trying to re repeat that entire moment of trauma. However, that reputation is always a belated reputation. It, it never can capture the full moment of trauma, the full experience of trauma. And that's why he keeps saying, if you remember, that it, this is a failed attempt. This is an example of failed representation, right? So, uh, the, the constant compulsion to repeat and return to the traumatic event 
uh, and which is not accessible anymore. And that's why the memory becomes unreliable. That's why the remembrance becomes unreliable, right? And that's why the idea of um, you know, belatedness comes into being. It's only a belated understanding. You can only understand it much later. It's incomplete and it's belated in a certain sense, right? Uh, so the traumatic event, while not available to consciousness, is bound to impose itself again in changed forms uh, on the consciousness of the victim, right? So there is that slippery quality about the traumatic um, you know, uh, reputation. It, it just becomes a changed form. So it may or may not be the original traumatic moment. It may or may not com uh, co correspond to the actual traumatic moment, right? Rather, what it, what it does is that it keeps reconfiguring the traumatic moment, and it's always a degree of uh, a departure, a degree of belatedness, a degree of uh, you know, distance from the traumatic moment. Right? So there is a change form of consciousness which trauma uh, you know, you know, generates, which trauma enacts. Right. Uh, one, if not the only way to heal a trauma, is giving testimony, which requires a highly collaborative relationship between speaker and listener. So you know, this is where Anne, Hy where Anne Whitehead comes in. And you know, interestingly, we will look at Whitehead's works uh, more uh, closely in the, in the concluding bit, as I mentioned. Now, the politics of testimony, the ontology of testimony, is is quite complex because it requires a level of empathy. It requires a level of a collaborative relationship between the speaker and the listener, right? So, and uh, that is the way in which trauma can be healed: the, the ability to confess, the ability to talk about trauma. Uh, the ability to give it a narrative design, a storytelling shape, and it must be accepted, it must be absorbed by someone. There must be a collaboration between the speaker and the listener, right? So that is a trauma, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the testimony of trauma is, you know, the, the, the mourning, the coping process, that, that healing process, the curative process can only take place through collaboration. So Anne Whitehead uh, claims that the impact of trauma can only adequately be represented by mimicking as forms and symptoms, right? So the, the operative word over here is mimicking. So you, you must, there's, there's a mimetic quality about representation. There's a mimetic quality about traumatic reputation. And again, if you go back to uh, the text which we just finished, which is uh, Kurt Vonnegut's uh, Slaughterhouse Five, there's always an attempt to mime the original even. There's always an attempt to just have a mimetic representation, a reputation. Uh, what had happened many years ago. And of course, there is a quality, there's an awareness that, you know, it's impossible to mime it completely. You can always, you can just attempt uh, and offer a shallow mimicry of it, an incomplete and insufficient mimicry of it. And the insufficiency is exactly what, it, what makes it a failed attempt, right? So there is that quality of mimicry about trauma. And a number of scholars have argued that Beloved and his insistence on circling back uh, uh, to traumatic events, as well as in its literalization of the haunting past through occurs, constitutes a particularly complex example of uh, exactly this mimicry. Now, it's interesting how all these different concepts are brought together. There's a course in Beloved, you know, the figure of Beloved, the, spe the spectral reputation, the return of the repressed, uh, the figure of the course which doesn't quite go away, you know, it just keeps coming back. And in that reputation of the ghostly figure, the reputation of the spectral figure, or the spectrality, uh, the reputation of spectrality, the, the recursivity of spectrality, is exactly what makes the mimicry happen over here. So there's a mimicry quality of our trauma. So it just keeps repeating over and over again. And mimicry becomes the only uh, mode of representation that Beloved is so trying to foreground here. So while Whitehead has located uh, this feature primarily in Beloved's repeated description of um, key episodes, uh, Naomi uh, Morgan Stern, for instance, has argued that in a status as a self-conscious neo-slave narrator, Beloved represents as well as enacts this process of testimony, right? So there is a quality of testimony because, you know, Beloved also uh, generates the listener uh, to a certain extent. So we, the reader, become the listener. Uh, to a certain extent. So it just becomes a testimony to trauma, a testimony to a traumatic experience, and the case being, the case in point being that of slavery. Right. Lockhurst in the trauma question has even extended this argument to the novel's treatment of its readers, in quoting Morrison's famous statement that she aims to create in the readers a compelling confusion. Similar to the characters, Lockhurst argues convincingly that Beloved's disruption of the narrative timeline and its withholding of important information actually subjects its readers to feelings of, uh, you know, uh, nachteilist or uh, belatedness, right? So this is a German word, 
uh, naturally kept or belatedness, and thus to a symptom of traumatic experience. Right, so, uh, I mean, Lockhurst's idea of uh, belatedness is interesting because it, it, what it's telling us is, as readers, you only get a belated understanding of what really happened. And there is that uh, cognitive confusion that Morrison's trying to generate. You know, that's part of the narrative design, per se. Now, interestingly, what it does is it allows a certain level of empathy between the reader and the characters, because even the characters inside the novel, uh, they, they, they are confused cognitively, and there's a sense of belated understanding of what may have happened. The real traumatic encounter, the real traumatic moment, uh, can only be processed in a very belated way, and that belatedness is also a, you know, a departure, a disruption uh, from the original event. Right now, that sense of confusion, that sense of cognitive experiential confusion is spilled over uh, into the reader as well. And you know, as readers too, we only get an incomplete and belated understanding of what really took place. And this is a technical term that Roger Lockhurst is using, the sense of belatedness. That, you know, you know, to understand trauma, uh, you can only do it through a mimicry which is belated in quality. It's, it's, it's a post-hoc understanding, but right? it's never really an immediate understanding. It can only be negotiated and engaged with uh, at a post-hoc level. You can look back at it, right, in a belated way. There's always a sense of uh, uh, temporality, a sense of, you know, time having passed. Right, okay, so in a similar argument regarding the inclusion of the reader and the traumatic experience, uh, Vincent O'Cafe has stated that in certain segments of the novel, traumatic memories of Seth Hain, Paul D, and Denver are fragmentary, circular, and revisionary bits that readers struggle to piece together. The ambiguity compels readers to, uh, to cross uh, uh, perceptual boundaries and attempt to re-inhabit the character's psychological processes, uh, as opposed to the registering passively their thoughts and memories as finished products. Now, the last bit is the most interesting bit, and I'm just going to end the session on this note. The lack of finishedness, you know, or the unfinished quality in the novel is something which is very interesting, and that's very deliberately done. So there's an unfinished understanding, there's an un incomplete understanding, and that, you know, the, the, the rejection, the finished product of understanding, that rejection, that resistance to us, this finishedness uh, is exactly part of the traumatic representation, right? So in other words, uh, what O'Kefe is saying over here is part of the narrative design of Toni Morrison. But if you're writing a book of fiction about trauma, right, especially if it's historical trauma, intergenerational inequality, like slavery, uh, there, there should always be a sense of open-endedness. So in a, in a certain sense, when you look back at it, there's a sense of belatedness. You only understand it later, right? So the immediate understanding is unavailable to us, right? So there is a spectral belated quality of understanding. And then again, even that understanding too is unfinished in quality. So that unfinished quality of understanding is something which is part of the uh, the cognitive confusion uh, that trauma has, right? And so in a certain sense, this becomes a very authentic representation, a very legitimate representation of the traumatic mind, especially in fiction. So the narrative confusion, the different orders of narrative that uh, Morrison is playing and entangling together, uh, which is frustrating the reader, which is confusing the reader. So that cognitive confusion becomes very much part of the, uh, the authorial strategy uh, to which trauma can be uh, belatedly engaged with as well as uh, incompletely understood. So there's unfinished quality and the belated quality and the reputation quality of trauma. These are all woven together in this novel, which is also a very profound historical novel about the intergenerational quality of slavery, torture, abuse, uh, at a very corporeal uh, category, the body is abused, the black body is abused, there's violence directed at the black body, but at the same time, there's also a system of uh, epistemic abuse, or identity abuse, how the identity is denied, how the agency is denied. So in that sense, it becomes a complex condition, which is corporeal, as well as uh, affective and experiential in quality, or psychological in quality, right? So I'll stop at this point today, but I think these are the conceptual categories that this essay is trying to foreground and how uh, Morrison's novel becomes a wonderful experiment in fiction in which uh, all these different categories in trauma fiction or trauma theory are brought together uh, very compellingly. Uh, and then we have a depiction of slavery, depiction of spectrality, depiction of uh, recursivity uh, as very, very uh, complex conditions, as well as political conditions, cognitive conditions. So this is what we will go on with uh, in the subsequent sessions. Thank you for your attention.